Hey again, everybody. We're going to be doing um, echoes today, or cardiac ultrasound. Uh, again, this is Pete Croft. I'm just going to do a short segment on echoes, which is kind of the most, from speaking to people, the most feared of of all these modalities. Uh, it tends to be the most frustrating for people, I think, is the most applicable word. It can be difficult to find in some patients. Sometimes you got to do the best you can and get the best views you can. These views today will be uh, hopefully good and some, and will provide you with some learning and some education. Um, we're going to be going over each of the uh, the views, whether it's the long axis view, which is this view we're looking at on the screen now, and then we'll be looking at the short axis, well, it's the apical four chamber uh, views, and we'll be talking about the applications that we're using um, and uh, trying to implement with getting these views. Um, Here's a long axis view of the heart. Um, this is the only instance, or one of the only instances, um, that you're going to be using the probe and uh, orienting it towards the left side of the patient. In this case, I usually start, as you can see, right in the middle of the chest, and then I'll just bring my probe over leftward. And if you do that, you'll generally find some sort of a view. And again, what I try to stress when I teach this is move it, move the pro probe quite a bit at first, so what I call macro movements. So big movements at first, when you see something, stop, and then start using small or micro movements to gain a better image. Whether that's rocking it, fanning it, or tilting the probe, that's a good technique to have, whether it's the heart or anything else you're trying to find in the body. So macro movements and then micro movements. In this case, moving from the center of the body, or right on the sternum, and then just move a little laterally to the left to gain this image. As you can see here, left atrium, left ventricle, outflow tract, nice aortic view, and here again is your right ventricle, which as you can see is closest to the probe. This structure here is a good one to remember. Again, um, this is the descending thoracic aorta. If you can imagine, the aorta wraps around, comes off here, off the heart, and then will wrap around and actually come towards you um, and downward uh, towards the abdomen. Here. It's the landmark to differentiate between pleural or thoracic from pericardial effusions, and we'll talk about that shortly. To gain the short axis view, you're simply going to take your probe and you're going to rotate it right where you were, and you're just going to rotate it to the right hip. So you're moving from the left hip here, just twist it, get used to that motion, take it to the right hip, and here's your corresponding image here on the ultrasound to show you what I mean. So long axis, twist, here's your short axis. Right ventricle closest to the probe, here's your LV, and this is the view where you're going to be assessing contractility and looking for any significant or overt wall motion abnormality. Um, here, uh, again, here this, this is just a representation of fanning all the way through the short axis. Once you get this view of the short axis, here's your LV, you can rock your probe and go down towards the apex of the heart and then up to the base of the heart, which is right here. When you get that towards the base, which is a term that always has confounded me because the base of the heart is actually the top of the heart, but you're going to see your aortic valve root here, and then you're going to sweep all the way down here on the, on the right. You can see uh, Scott here scanning all the way down towards the apex right here through the mitral valve towards the apex. Here's your apical four chamber. Again, the way I get this is I go from a long axis view right up here in the top left at the beginning, and then I'm going to move my probe right underneath the nipple, and I'm going to point the probe to the right of the patient. And that will generally give you this nice view of the heart. The goal on this view is to get both valves, both the mitral valve here and the tricuspid valve here in view. Kind of looks like a four square beam. Once you get a good view, you'll have all, both ventricles, both atria in your view, the left atrium and your right atrium here. This is the view, where, the best view to assess for any right ventricular dilation or strain. <clears throat> this is a normal view of the heart, as we can see here. This is a view which is sometimes troublesome to get depending on your patient tricks you can do um, are just simply moving the patient's arm, left arm above their head 
as well as having them roll just slightly over to the left. That'll bring the heart kind of towards the, the surface of the body a little easier, uh, a little more, and lets you get your view easier. <clears throat> Here's a super sternal view. Why you do this view if you're concerned about a dissection. So if you see a large aortic root, if you have a patient that has ripping chest pain and unstable and unstable or unequal pulses, et cetera, et cetera, if you're worried about that, all you got to do, and there's no rhyme or reason to this one, just stick your probe, your phased array probe up above the suprasternal notch, and you're going to be looking down, downward at the aorta um, and the aortic arch. So this is your aortic arch here with a dissection. You can see a nice flap here in the middle of this arch. Why are we doing this? I alluded to this at the beginning. We have a few pointed questions we want to ask here in the ED when we're doing echoes. Echoes are neat things. You can do lots of more advanced studies, but for the basic, you know, critical actions, clinical changing actions in the ED, these are the things that you want to make sure you are perfecting. Is uh, differentiating between a pericardial effusion and a fat pad. Um, seeing if the effusion is causing any strain in the heart. You want to also be able to tell if the RV is dilated. You're concerned about a PE. Uh, and lastly, you, you just want to get a sense of the contractility of the heart. If you have a patient with hy hypotension or shock, uh, that can certainly change your management about whether you're going to give fluids or you're going to give um, some vasopressor support for the blood pressure. Um, here's some pathologic cases. Um, these are all four views, and this is a sick heart here that looks like it's in fibrillation with surrounding large pericardial effusion. This one is not hard to miss. What I will point out here is this view here, which is your long axis view, and this structure here is your descending thoracic aorta. This is the one I mentioned before, which is going to be help you differentiate, differentiate between a pleural and a pericardial effusion. As you can see here, the fluid is tracking in front of the aorta in front of that DTA, and this is going to be a pericardial effusion, which you can obviously see with the other images, but if you only have this image, this is the structure you'd have to uh, notice and verify. This kind of just highlights that point. Again, in front of the DTA, you see here these yellow and blue in front of the descending thoracic aorta. Here, the pleural effusion goes in back of the descending aorta. So the thoracic aorta is here. You see the stops here and will track behind behind the aorta. So this is a pleural effusion. This here is a uh, pericardial effusion. I hope that makes sense. Um, when we assess for tamponade, basically on ultrasound, you're, you can either look at the right atrium, which is tends to be the first thing to um, show some scalloping. Uh, or inward, the, the pressure from the outside of the heart is so much from the tamp from the uh, fluid that it's causing clinical tamponade and pushing inward on that right atrial wall. Or more commonly, and what's more commonly described as in textbooks, is the right ventricle is um, during diastasis, diastole in particular, but uh, is showing scalloping motion inward, and the pressure is causing um, uh, circulatory compromise. Um, Again, this is the long axis view, not a great view to look for the right ventricle and not one we ever use to assess right ventricle size, but you can see it's having a significant effect on the right ventricle. Here is your apical four chamber. Again, a lot of pressure from the outside onto that right ventricle. Um, this is important to differentiate between whether you're going to see uh, a pericardial effusion or what's called a fat pad. So, the, it can be tough, and you know, as many as you look at, you're still going to look at some and say, uh, "I'm not sure." But uh, in general, what I try to what I try to look for, what I try to make me think of a fat pad, is it almost looks like a little bit of a starry sky appearance. It's a hypoechoic, whereas a fat pad will be darker and more anechoic. Um, the other thing that can make you think that it's a fat pad is it kind of it seems to be stuck to the end, to the outside of the heart. With an effusion, um, it tends to have more versatility and more movement. The fat pad seems to be kind of tacked on to the heart surface, and it just looks sticky. I know that's more subjective, but to me, a fat pad just has a more characteristic appearance in how the dynamic changes uh, occur. So hypoechoic around the heart, likely a fat pad. Dark anechoic, likely an effusion.
this is what I mean here, dark anechoic. The interesting thing about this case is not that little effusion here, it's this large area here, which is actually clotted blood. So this is what's that called a hemorrhagic tamponade. This patient had either a ruptured LV or uh, some sort of catastrophic cardiac condition in which they extravasated blood out into their pericardium and this clotted off and this is more active or free or recent bleeding around around it. This heart's not not alive at this point. Uh, we alluded to some RV issues, so RV strain. Again, this is the four chamber, this is almost a five chamber. And what I mean by that is you can actually see the outflow tract from the LV into the aorta. This is what's used in more advanced cardiac imaging. Uh, echo imaging. But in general, this is a nice four chamber here. Again, you get that four square appearance. You get all the chambers and you have both valves that are in view. And in these uh, pictures, you're looking to see basically if the RV is bigger than the LV. If it's bigger than the LV, that's typically abnormal. It doesn't mean they have a PE. It just means that the RV is, has acutely or has chronically faced more pressure and grown greater size than the LV. In the setting of chronic COPD, pulmonary fibrosis, this can be the patient's, quote, normal finding, but in an acute setting, in a, especially in a younger patient um, with a story consistent with possible PE, that needs to really um, rise in your differential if you're seeing a big dilated RV and should and can precipitate giving thrombolytics um, acutely to the patient. LV bigger than RV on the right side here. RV bigger than LV. I hope you guys can see that uh, differentiation. So this is concerning over here on the right. This is normal. Here's your short axis. Again, right ventricle closest to the probe. Nice LV. Probe, again, remember, pointed towards the right hip. That's after getting the long axis and just twisting the probe. This is getting your right hip or towards your right hip. And this is a normal here. You should see the ventricle should look like a circle or an O. This should cause some concern for you as a sonographer. This D, what's called the D sign. Um, nice O here. Here's your D sign here. Essentially means that there's some, so much pressure in the RV that it's pressing down onto the left ventricle uh, wall and causing some compression there. From this view, I definitely get a four chamber view, but this should rise some concern in, in your mind. Um, another application we use it for is this kind of global assessment. I don't care whether the patient has 37% or 35% or 30%, as long as you can tell if there's a decrease in the ejection fraction acutely in the emergency department. This is a normal EF, nice squeeze, concentric, concentric wall, everything's coming towards the middle. This patient has a uh, significantly decreased or severely decreased ejection fraction where there's rarely, hardly any squeeze towards the middle. It's hard to appreciate any acute wall motion abnormalities in terms of uh, particular areas along the left ventricular wall, but a global assessment tells me that this patient's not going to respond well to a ton of fluids and will likely back that fluid up into their lungs before getting it out into their bloodstream and helping their blood pressure. Uh, here's a, another view. So this is just your long axis view and the same type of thing. The other, one caveat here is that with this view, I often look at the mitral valve, and uh, they talk about uh, normal mitral valve should almost touch your septum here. I think it's about four millimeters, what they say, um, is what is described as being a uh, robust or a normal ejection fraction. In this view, you can see this mitral valve excursion is, is poor and diminished, barely coming off this anterior leaf. It's barely, barely moving off, uh, as well as, as you can see here, the walls of the left ventricle aren't doing much in terms of squeeze, whereas in this case you have nice concentric squeeze um, and nice excursion of the mitral valve. So just another way to assess a different view. Uh, this is kind of exactly what I was just talking about um, and gives you a representation. Um, next off we're going to be moving on to pulmonary, so stay tuned.